Epistle to the Romans, Wikipedia Audio The Epistle to the Romans or Letter to the Romans, often shortened to Romans, is the sixth book in the New Testament. Biblical scholars agree that it was composed by the Apostle Paul to explain that salvation is offered through the Gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the longest of the Pauline epistles and is often considered his most important theological legacy and magnum opus. In the opinion of Jesuit scholar Joseph Fitzmaier, the book overwhelms the reader by the density and sublimity of the topic with which it deals, the gospel of the justification and salvation of Jew and Greek alike by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ revealing the uprightness and love of God the Father. N.T. Wright notes that Romans is General Presentation Neither a systematic theology nor a summary of Paul's life work, but it is by common consent his masterpiece. It dwarfs most of his other writings, an alpine peak towering over hills and villages. Not all onlookers have viewed it in the same light or from the same angle, and their snapshots and paintings of it are sometimes remarkably unalike. Not all climbers have taken the same route up its sheer sides, and there is frequent disagreement on the best approach. What nobody doubts is that we are here dealing with a work of massive substance, presenting a formidable intellectual challenge while offering a breathtaking theological and spiritual vision. The scholarly consensus is that Paul authored the epistle to the Romans. Needed. P. A. Is found in these manuscripts, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Alexandrinus, Codex Vaticanus, Codex Ephremi Rescriptus, Codex Claramontanus, P. A. E. A. F. A. P. B. 2, D. 2, P. A. E. A. F. A. P. D. A. F. S. S. T. D. A. 42, 90, 216. 339, 462, 466 asterisk, 642, E, A, F, P, A, E, P, S, T, D, A, E, T, Ep, Foot, D, D, A, F, S, S, A, P, T, E E E A E S A only in 337 P A E A F A P D A F S S T D A T E E E A E S A 101 241 460 466 469 602 603 605 618 1923 1924 1927 1932, followed by Textus Receptus. C. E. B. Cranfield, in the introduction to his commentary on Romans, says, The denial of Paul's authorship of Romans by such critics, is now rightly relegated to a place among the curiosities of N.T. scholarship. Today no responsible criticism disputes its Pauline origin. The evidence of its use in the Apostolic Fathers is clear, and before the end of the second century it is listed and cited as Paul's. Every extant early list of N.T. books includes it among his letters. The external evidence of authenticity could indeed hardly be stronger, 
and it is altogether borne out by the internal evidence, linguistic, stylistic, literary, historical and theological. The letter was most probably written while Paul was in Corinth, probably while he was staying in the house of Gaius, and transcribed by Tertius his amanuensis. There are a number of reasons why Corinth is considered most plausible. Paul was about to travel to Jerusalem on writing the letter, which matches Acts where it is reported that Paul stayed for three months in Greece. This probably implies Corinth as it was the location of Paul's greatest missionary success in Greece. Additionally Phoebe was a deacon of the church in Sencre, a port to the east of Corinth, and would have been able to convey the letter to Rome after passing through Corinth and taking a ship from Corinth's west port. Erastus, mentioned in Romans 16.23, also lived in Corinth being the city's commissioner for public works and city treasurer at various times, again indicating that the letter was written in Corinth. The precise time at which it was written is not mentioned in the epistle, but it was obviously written when the collection for Jerusalem had been assembled and Paul was about to go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, that is, at the close of his second visit to Greece during the winter preceding his last visit to that city. The majority of scholars writing on Romans propose the letter was written in late 55-early 56 or late 56-early 57. Early 55 and early 58 both have some support, while German New Testament scholar Gerd Ludemann argues for a date as early as 51-52, following on from Knox who proposed 53 54 Ludemann is the only serious challenge to the consensus of mid to late 50s. Some manuscripts have a subscription at the end of the epistle. Personal Greetings, Closing Doxology For ten years before writing the letter, Paul had traveled around the territories bordering the Aegean Sea evangelizing. Churches had been planted in the Roman provinces of Galatia, Macedonia, Achaia, and Asia. Paul, considering his task complete, wanted to preach the gospel in Spain, where he would not build upon another man's foundation. This allowed him to visit Rome on the way, a long-time ambition of his. The letter to the Romans, in part, prepares them and gives reasons for his visit. In addition to Paul's geographic location, his religious views are important. First, Paul was a Hellenistic Jew with a Pharisaic background, integral to his identity, see Paul the Apostle and Judaism for details. His concern for his people is one part of the dialogue and runs throughout the letter. Second. The other side of the dialogue is Paul's conversion and calling to follow Christ in the early 30s. Bible Gateway 35 Languages 50 Versions, Epistle to the Romans Early Christian Writings, Online Bible Gospel Hall.org, Romans, Online Bible Christ Notes.org, Unbound Bible 100 Plus Languages slash Versions Biola University. Epistle to the Romans, Bible, Romans Public Domain Audiobook at LibriVox Various Versions Authorship The most probable ancient account of the beginning of Christianity in Rome is given by a 4th century writer known as Ambrosius Ter. It is established that there were Jews living in Rome in the times of the Apostles, and that those Jews who had believed passed on to the Romans the tradition that they ought to profess Christ but keep the law. One ought not to condemn the Romans, but to praise their faith, because without seeing any signs or miracles and without seeing any of the apostles, they nevertheless accepted faith in Christ, although according to a Jewish rite. From Adam Clark the occasion of writing the epistle. 
Paul had made acquaintance with all circumstances of the Christians at Rome, and finding that it was, partly of heathens converted to Christianity, and partly of Jews, who had, with many remaining prejudices, believed in Jesus as the true Messiah, and that many contentions arose from the claims of the Gentiles to equal privileges with the Jews, and from absolute refusal of the Jews to admit these claims, unless the Gentile converts become circumcised, he wrote this epistle to a just end. Settle these differences. At this time, the Jews made up a substantial number in Rome, and their synagogues, frequented by many, enabled the Gentiles to become acquainted with the story of Jesus of Nazareth. Consequently, churches composed of both Jews and Gentiles were formed at Rome. According to Irenaeus, a second-century church father, the church at Rome was founded directly by the apostles Peter and Paul. However, many modern scholars disagree with Irenaeus, holding that while little is known of the circumstances of the church's founding, it was not founded by Paul. Many of the brethren went out to meet Paul on his approach to Rome. There is evidence that Christians were then in Rome in considerable numbers and probably had more than one place of meeting. Note the large number of names in Romans 16, 3:15 of those then in Rome, and verses 5, 15, and 16 indicate there was more than one church assembly or company of believers in Rome. Verse 5 mentions a church that met in the house of Aquila and Priscilla. Verses 14 and 15 each mention groupings of believers and saints. Dating Subscriptions Jews were expelled from Rome because of disturbances around AD 49 by the Edict of Claudius. Fitzmaier claims that both Jews and Jewish Christians were expelled as a result of their infighting. Claudius died around the year AD 54, and his successor, Emperor Nero, allowed the Jews back into Rome, but then, after the Great Fire of Rome of 64, Christians were persecuted. Fitzmaier argues that with the return of the Jews to Rome in 54 new conflict arose between the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians who had formerly been expelled. Keck thinks Gentile Christians may have developed a dislike of or looked down on Jews, because they theologically rationalized that Jews were no longer God's people. A Brief Introduction to Romans Understanding Romans 7 www.christians.eu, a Wesleyan interpretation of Romans 5 8 Jerry McCant, Epistle to the Romans Catholic Encyclopedia, John Calvin on Romans, Istan's Bible Dictionary on Romans, Epistle to the on Bible Study Tools.com, Matthew Henry on Romans, Romans Overview, by Mark Dever, Reading Through Romans, by Michael Morrison, Romans The Greatest Letter Ever Written, John Piper, Book by Book, Romans, by Wells-Whataboutjesus.com Paul's Life in Relation to His Epistle The Churches in Rome Style Purposes of Writing Contents Scholars often have difficulty assessing whether Romans is a letter or an epistle, a relevant distinction in form critical analysis. A letter is something non-literary, a means of communication between persons who are separated from each other. Confidential and personal in nature, it is intended only for the person or persons to whom it is addressed and not at all for the public or any kind of publicity, an epistle is an artistic literary form, just like the dialogue, the oration, or the drama. It has nothing in common with the letter except its form, apart from that one might venture the paradox that the epistle is the opposite of a real letter. 
The contents of the epistle are intended for publicity they aim at interesting the public. Joseph Fitzmaier argues, from evidence put forth by Steyerwalt, that the style of Romans is an essay letter. Philip Melanchthon, a writer during the Reformation, suggested that Romans was caput et summa universi doctrini Christiani. While some scholars attempt to suggest, like Melanchthon, that it is a type of theological treatise, this view largely ignores chapters 14 and 15 of Romans. There are also many noteworthy elements missing from Romans that are included in other areas of the Pauline corpus. The breakdown of Romans as a treatise began with F.C. Bauer in 1836 when he suggested this letter had to be interpreted according to the historical circumstances in which Paul wrote it. Prologue Paul sometimes uses a style of writing common in his time called a diatribe. He appears to be responding to a heckler, and the letter is structured as a series of arguments. In the flow of the letter, Paul shifts his arguments, sometimes addressing the Jewish members of the church, sometimes the Gentile membership and sometimes the church as a whole. To review the current scholarly viewpoints on the purpose of Romans, along with a bibliography, see Dictionary of Paul and his letters. For a 16th century Lollard reformer view, see the work of William Tyndall. In his prologue to his translation of the Book of Romans, which was largely taken from the prologue of German reformer Martin Luther, Tyndall writes that this epistle is the principal and most excellent part of the New Testament, and most pure Evangelion, that is to say glad tidings and what we call the Gospel, and also a light and a way in unto the whole Scripture. The sum and whole cause of the writings of this epistle, is, to prove that a man is justified by faith only, which proposition whoso denieth, to him is not only this epistle and all that Paul writes but also the whole scripture, so locked up that he shall never understand it to his soul's health. And to bring a man to the understanding and feeling that faith only justifieth, Paul proveth that the whole nature of man is so poisoned and so corrupt, yet and so dead concerning godly living or godly thinking, that it is impossible for her to keep the law in the sight of God. This essay letter composed by Paul was written to a specific audience at a specific time, to understand it, the situations of both Paul and the recipients must be understood. The introduction provides some general notes about Paul. He introduces his apostleship here and introductory notes about the gospel he wishes to preach to the church at Rome. Jesus' human line stems from David. Paul, however, does not limit his ministry to Jews. Paul's goal is that the Gentiles would also hear the gospel. He commends the Romans for their faith. Paul also speaks of the past obstacles that have blocked his coming to Rome earlier. Paul's announcement that he is not ashamed of his gospel because it holds power. These two verses form a backdrop for the rest of the book. First, we note that Paul is unashamed of his love for this gospel that he preaches about Jesus Christ. He also notes that he is speaking to the Jew first. There is significance to this, but much of it is scholarly conjecture as the relationship of Paul the Apostle and Judaism is still debated. We are hard-pressed to find an answer to such a question without knowing more about the audience in question. Wayne Brindle argues, based on Paul's former writings against the Judaizers in Galatians and 2 Corinthians, that rumors had probably spread about Paul totally negating the Jewish existence in a Christian world. Paul may have used the Jew-first approach to counter such a view. Greeting Paul now begins into the main thrust of his letter. 
he begins by suggesting that humans have taken up ungodliness and wickedness for which there will be wrath from God. People have taken God's invisible image and made him into an idol. Paul draws heavily here from the wisdom of Solomon. He condemns unnatural sexual behavior and warns that such behavior will result in a depraved body and mind and says that people who do such things are worthy of death. Paul stands firmly against the idol worship system which was common in Rome. Several scholars believe the passage is a non-Pauline interpolation. On the traditional Protestant interpretation, Paul here calls out Jews who are condemning others for not following the law when they themselves are also not following the law. Stanley Stawers, however, has argued on rhetorical grounds that Paul is in these verses not addressing a Jew at all but rather an easily recognizable caricature of the typical boastful person. Stawers writes, there is absolutely no justification for reading 2 1.5 as Paul's attack on the hypocrisy of the Jew. No one in the first century would have identified Hoalazan with Judaism. That popular interpretation depends upon anachronistically reading later Christian characterizations of Jews as hypocritical Pharisees. See also Anti-Judaism Prayer of Thanksgiving Paul says that a righteousness from God has made itself known apart from the law, to which the law and prophets testify, and this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus to all who believe. He describes justification legally clearing the believer of the guilt and penalty of sin as a gift of God, and not the work of man, but by faith. In chapters 5 through 8, Paul argues that believers can be assured of their hope in salvation, having been freed from the bondage of sin. Paul teaches that through faith, the faithful have been joined with Jesus and freed from sin. Believers should celebrate in the assurance of salvation and be certain that no external force or party can take their salvation away from them. This promise is open to everyone since everyone has sinned, save the one who paid for all of them. Salvation in the Christ Righteousness of God Condemnation, the universal corruption of Gentiles and Jews in chapters 9-11 Paul addresses the faithfulness of God to the Israelites, where he says that God has been faithful to his promise. Paul hopes that all Israelites will come to realize the truth since he himself was also an Israelite, and had in the past been a persecutor of early Christians. In Romans 9-11 Paul talks about how the nation of Israel has been cast away, and the conditions under which Israel will be God's chosen nation again, when Israel returns to its faith, sets aside its unbelief. In Romans 7 1, Paul says that humans are under the law while we live, know ye not, that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. However, Jesus' death on the cross makes believers dead to the law according to an antinomistic interpretation. From chapter 12 through the first part of chapter 15, Paul outlines how the gospel transforms believers and the behavior that results from such a transformation. This transformation is described as a renewing of your mind, a transformation that Douglas J. Mu characterizes as the heart of the matter. It is a transformation so radical that it amounts to a, a transfiguration of your brain, a metanoia, a mental revolution. Paul goes on to describe how believers should live. Christians are no longer under the law, that is, no longer bound by the law of Moses, but under the grace of God, see law and grace. We do not need to live under the law because to the extent our minds have been renewed, we will know almost instinctively what God wants of us. The law then provides an objective standard for judging progress in the lifelong process of our mind's renewal.
to the extent they have been set free from sin by renewed minds, believers are no longer bound to sin. Believers are free to live in obedience to God and love everybody. As Paul says in Romans 13:10, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of law. The fragment in Romans 13:17 dealing with obedience to earthly powers is considered by some, for example James Collis, to be an interpolation. Paul Tillich accepts the historical authenticity of Romans 13:17 but claims it has been misinterpreted by churches with an anti-revolutionary bias. One of the many politico-theological abuses of biblical statements is the understanding of Paul's words as justifying the anti-revolutionary bias of some churches, particularly the Lutheran. But neither these words nor any other New Testament statement deals with the methods of gaining political power. In Romans, Paul is addressing eschatological enthusiasts, not a revolutionary political movement. The concluding verses contain a description of his travel plans, personal greetings, and salutations. One third of the 21 Christians identified in the greetings are women, some of whom played an important role in the early church at Rome. Additionally, none of these Christians answer to the name Peter although according to the Catholic storyline, he had been ruling as Pope in Rome for about 25 years. Possibly related was the incident at Antioch between Paul and Cephas. Catholics accept the necessity of faith for salvation but point to Romans 2,5-11 for the necessity of living a virtuous life as well. But by your heart and impenitent heart you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. For he will render to every man according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life, but for those who are factious and do not obey the truth, but obey wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for every one who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. Throughout his writings, St. Augustine strongly affirms the Catholic understanding of this and other such scriptural admonitions. In his sermons to his Catholic congregations, he is especially careful to warn them against an inordinate desire for a complete assurance of salvation. In his exposition of Psalm 147 for example, he states, The Gospel warned us, be on the watch for the last day, the day when the Son of Man will come because it will spell disaster for those it finds secure as they are now secure for the wrong reasons, I mean, secure in the pleasures of this world, when they ought to be secure only when they have dominated this world's lusts. The Apostle certainly prepares us for that future life in words of which I also reminded you on that occasion. Again, in his exposition of Psalm 85, Augustine is perhaps even more specific. Let us not expect security while we are on pilgrimage. When we do find ourselves wanting it, what we are looking for is bodily sluggishness rather than personal security. In the Protestant interpretation, the New Testament epistles, describes salvation as coming from faith and not from righteous actions. For example, Romans 4 25. They also point out that in Romans chapter 2 9, Paul says that God will reward those who follow the law and then goes on to say that no one follows the law perfectly. Romans 2 21 25. Martin Luther described Paul's letter to the Romans as the most important piece in the New Testament. It is purest gospel. 
it is well worth a Christian's while not only to memorize it word for word but also to occupy himself with it daily, as though it were the daily bread of the soul. Luther controversially added the word alone to Romans 3.28 so that it read, Thus, we hold, then, that man is justified without doing the works of the law, alone through faith. The word alone does not appear in the original Greek text, but Luther defended his translation by maintaining that the adverb alone was required both by idiomatic German and Paul's intended meaning. This is a literalist view rather than an literal view of the Bible. Apologist James Swan lists numerous Catholic sources that also translated Romans 3.28 with the word alone, or testified to others doing so before Luther. A Bible commentary published in 1864 reports that Catholic translators before the time of Luther had given the same translation. So in the Nuremberg Bible, 1483, Nerdirk den Glauben, and the Italian Bibles of Geneva, 1476, and of Venice, 1538, per sola feed. The Fathers also often use the expression, man is justified by faith alone. The Romans Road refers to a set of scriptures from Romans that Christian evangelists used to present a clear and simple case for personal salvation to each person, as all the verses are contained in one single book, making it easier for evangelism without going back and forth through the entire New Testament. The core verses used by nearly all groups using Romans Road are, Romans 3.23, 623, 5,8, 10,9, and 10,13. Romans has been at the forefront of several major movements in Protestantism. Martin Luther's lectures on Romans in 1515-1516 probably coincided with the development of his criticism of Roman Catholicism which led to the 95 Theses of 1517. In 1738, while hearing Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans read at St. Botolph Church on Aldersgate Street in London, John Wesley famously felt his heart strangely warmed, a conversion experience which is often seen as the beginning of Methodism. In 1919 Karl Barth's commentary on Romans, the Epistle to the Romans, was the publication which is widely seen as the beginning of Neo-Orthodoxy. Translations Other Books of the Bible The Judgment of God Paul's Warning of Hypocrites Justification, the Gift of Grace and Forgiveness Through Faith Assurance of Salvation Transformation of Believers Obedience to Earthly Powers Epilogue Paul's Ministry and Travel Plans Hermeneutics Catholic Interpretation Protestant Interpretation Notes